Please welcome Kim Severson, Michelle Nishan, and Jilly Stevens. I had to make sure you guys were actually following me. It would have been embarrassing to sit here and... Uh, so hi again. Um, I'm, I'm allowed to sit down this time as opposed to with Marion Nessel who made me stand up. So thank you guys for that. Oh, you're welcome. Um, Michelle Nishan, who is, um, in fact, the last time I saw you, uh, we were testing edible marijuana products in Boulder. That's right. Remember that? Yeah. All right. No, I don't. I don't remember it. <laughs> it was for research, and I didn't. <laughs> I didn't imbibe. But at, like at midnight, there were a couple chefs knocking on my door. They're like, "We're gonna go get tacos. Do you guys want to come?" It's like, <laughs> go back to bed, boys. Anyway. But seriously, uh, uh, Michelle Nishan is the CEO of Wholesome Wave, which many of you may know uh, about. In, in 2008, they piloted this idea that they would get farmers markets to um, double SNAP benefits. Very simple idea. I think you had 12 markets to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, now it's in 33 states uh, in DC, more than, at more than 500 farmers markets. Um, We'll talk about the USDA is actually giving grant money now. We can talk a little bit about that later. Julie Stevens is um, CEO of City Harvest. Uh, there are 1.4 million people who are hungry in New York, and your organization helps feed more than a million of them. That's right, yeah. Um, and this is against a backdrop of 48 million people who are hungry in this country. Um, so we've been talking a lot about, you know, people who, um, you know, poor people, how do we get... Uh, you know, affordable, healthy food to poor people. We've been talking a lot about it this conf at this at this conference. These are two people who work with uh, those folks all the time. So I think this will be really an informative um, 20 minutes. So let's let's start talk about uh, this concept of food deserts, which um, I heard somebody this morning call f actually food apartheid. But it's been very fashionable to talk about food deserts, and certainly major grocery store chains have gotten a lot of tax incentives and help to put their markets in the middle of, of neighborhoods that didn't have access to food. But are food deserts, I mean, that's a, it's a kind of a terrible term, and I think there's some debate about whether if you just put healthy food in the middle of a, uh, of a poor neighborhood, if they're actually going to go and buy broccoli and cook it at home that night. So what's your, let's talk, discuss food deserts for a minute. Well, I think um, I, I'm in agreement that it's, it's a little bit of an odd term because there's plenty of food in these communities that are being classified as food deserts, but um, there's not much good food or healthy food lots of food, just not, not the good stuff. And I think without addressing affordability, it's kind of like opening a Mercedes uh, dealership in rural Alabama. Um, you can market and spend millions of dollars trying to convince people from rural Alabama why a, Mer a brand new Mercedes is better than a used pickup truck, but at the end of the day, they're gonna buy the used pickup truck because that's all they can afford. And I think when we look at things like Easy Mac and instant rice and instant noodles, these are kind of the used pickup truck of our food system. That's what these families can afford. But they spend, last year they spent almost $80 billion in SNAP benefits and then a matching $80 billion of their own. So it's a $160 billion retail food consumer marketplace. And I think there's a lot of untapped power in that. And these are the folks that are living in these so-called food deserts. And that's why a company like Walmart's attracted to putting a, a store in the middle of all that. A lot of money there. All right, Julie, what's your position on it? Is, is a food desert a thing? What is that, that term we're using? Well, technically it's not a thing in New York City because it, we're too condensed. Right. But certainly within the five boroughs of New York City, we're seeing big, big areas of land and communities where people don't have anywhere to go and spend what is a very scarce food dollar for them. Um, they don't have somewhere to go and spend it in a way that's healthy where they can have access to good quality, affordable, nutritious food. And that's some of the work we're working to address. How are you doing that? What are you doing to address well, that? Well, City Harvest has been around for 33 years. And our original mission is the mission we have today is to end hunger in New York City. And we started doing that um, by collecting really good quality food that would otherwise go to waste and getting it on a hungry person's table usually the same day. That program is still going on. This year, we'll move 55 million pounds of food that would otherwise go to waste. Over half of it will be fresh fruits and vegetables. Yeah. Um, we have programs called Healthy Neighborhoods, which go beyond that. And that's really all about beginning to create demand for healthier food. And then working on the supply side with the bodega owners and the supermarket owners in very poor neighborhoods to have them think differently about what they're stocking. And then with some magic 
programming in between. It has a lot to do with nutrition education as well, and lots of great organizations in the city are involved in that. We are seeing that people are choosing to spend that scarce food dollar differently when there's somewhere in the neighborhood they can go. And so we're really seeing that, that move that, that people want to cook or they have the time to cook. If you're, you know, you've got kids and a job or two and a bus that you've got to catch, are you really going to take time to, to peel and cook vegetables? Are you finding that well, that actually most, works? It, what's interesting, is, uh, uh, it's, it's a huge misnomer. Um, SNAP consumers actually spend more time cooking at home and preparing meals than the average consumer does because that's how they can best afford to put food on the table. There's this misnomer that people are using their SNAP benefits to buy, um, you know, dollar meals and, and, and happy meals. You can't use a SNAP uh, benefit to buy uh, fast food. You can use it only to buy food that you can mostly prepare at you home. You can't even buy a rotisserie chicken at the grocery store, right? Or is no, it not, not it's a no, prepared, it's yeah. Great. Prepared foods. Yeah. It's a and, really strict. You know, what, what's interesting is, is that, you know, there is this thought that, that these, out of the 48 million that you mentioned, many of those are children and disabled and veterans, and then there's 21 million functioning adults who are decision makers who actually spend that $80 billion. And a Happy Meal is a luxury. It is a special occasion. Um, you know, when we talked just, you know, the previous conversation of being willing to pay for quality, there are 21 million Americans who, who can only afford to pay for what many of us would consider to be crap. And I'm just going to be honest. But it's a treat. Yeah, but it's a treat because you want your kids to feel as normal as the child that they're going to school with who has more disposable income uh, and can talk about that great happy meal that they had last night. What's interesting, I think, and, and Jilly sees this, and I know because um, you know we know each other and admire each other's work, is that when you actually can go into these communities and work with retailers to change the paradigm and make healthier food affordable, what, what we do through um, the doubling program, doubling SNAP when spent on fruits and vegetables and our fruit and vegetable prescription program, which is where doctors actually give a prescription that's worth the value of fruits and vegetables that can be exchanged for that. The enthusiasm with which these parents go after affordability is astonishing. It's striking. It's striking. It's, it's, um, there's a real power there. When I, when I think that, you know, um, President Obama won by a landslide of 2 million votes, and you have 21 million Americans that spend $160 billion uh, on retail food, if they actually knew the power that they had as a consumer market, and you could turn that into a reason for them to take a little time off of their one, three part-time jobs to equal a full-time job to go to the polls and vote, based on food issue, hello food policy action, and connecting with low income consumers, I think that there's an opportunity through these communities to see some real heroism in reclaiming our democracy through food. I think it can happen. We're done here. We're going to leave I, I mean, I'm serious. Well, I you, really believe right. that. I'm sorry if I what's, got a little no, carried no, away. No, no, it's, it's <laughs> fantastic. So what, what's yeah. your, I mean, what about the power that a poor person has in this world in, in a food choice. I mean, is there, is there power in the, the numbers of people who, are, uh, who don't have enough, uh, enough food? I mean, is that, is that, a, is that a, a group we can, we can actually get to turn this around? I believe so. I think Michelle's quite right. I think it takes some time. Um, a really important part of the Healthy Neighborhoods Initiative, aside from the supply and the demand, is something called the Community Action Networks. Mm. And we're, we're trying to take, we are taking a back seat and really serving as a catalyst to help the community action networks within each of the neighborhoods really find their own voice around food. And it's remarkable. Mm -hmm. um, the changes they're making within the community, the conversations they're having with mm -hmm. one another, um, it's very visible and, and it's having an effect. The, the community action network in, in Brooklyn, for example, is all about growing. It's about growing in those small plots of land and getting the produce that they're growing into the local cafes. In Staten Island, it's about getting the bodegas to think differently about what they're stocking and, and sort of the my plate challenge mm -hmm. that they're running. Do you have so, any measurables about that at the bodegas in particular? I know that there were some issues around whether the they were ordering food that they were ordering fruits and vegetables that might be going bad. I know people you were bringing coolers in so they could have. Um, and that a lot of bodega owners kind of were given up on it. Is it is it actually making progress? Well, it's a heavy lift. I mean, we have a staff, a, a retail program staff that's working with the bodega owners in the supermarkets, and we're seeing good results. Um, in the last year, 
produce as a percentage of sales went up to 14% from 10% the prior year. For the, the bodegas that are in the yeah. pilot program. And yeah. how many bodegas are in that program? We have 20 supermarkets and bodegas. Okay. Um, and it, we're seeing some good so results. So in all of New York City is 20. So. In each of the five neighborhoods. Oh, okay. So we have five neighborhoods and those are sort of small geographic areas mm -hmm. where we're focusing. And, and our hope is that over some time, we can begin to demonstrate and show the kind of results we're seeing and have that replicated mm -hmm. in other places. And how long have you been in this, uh, this uh, hunger racket thing that you do? How long is it? <laughs> this racket, I've been in 11 years. 11 years. Yeah. Are you seeing, do you feel dis, dis, uh, disheartened a lot or do you feel like there's real change being made? I, I mean, I feel like we've had this conversation yeah. over the years. You know, it's not disheartened because this, this programming is great programming. We're seeing good results and we're getting good food into the hands of Hungry New York. That's not, that can't be disheartening. However, mm -hmm. the numbers continue to grow. And, and I'll admit that after the recession hit in early 2009, 2010, I'd be out speaking with donors saying, the numbers shot up 15%. We're serving 15% 15, 15 more people. We expect those numbers to recede. And they never did. Mm -hmm. They haven't grown quite as fast, but they've never receded. How is hunger ranking as you're going out, and you can answer this too, when you're going out talking to funders for money and, um, you know, the, you sort of see this incredible wealth uh, coming through um, venture capitalism and through, you know, the Googles and the Twitter and the Snapchat. Um, is hunger a sell there when you're going out for funding? Is it, is it easy to to sell hunger is something to give money to, or are they more interested in other, uh, giving money to other aspects of the food, uh, the food movement? It's tough. I mean, we have some great donors, and, and we estimate we're one of the largest privately funded human service organizations in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, this year, we have to raise $29 million, and that seems like a steep hill mm -hmm. at the beginning of each fiscal year. We've got baskets at the back. Yeah, so. thank you. <laughs> Um, but we, and we have to raise more. If we, if we just keep doing what we're doing, we have to grow at three to five percent a year. You so guys it's to tough. Baskets too. Right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And what about you and your? Yeah, I think you know I'm very, actually very hopeful. And we're, it's um, for us not as much about hunger as it is about the impact of changing the decisions of what type of food 21 million people might buy. Mm -hmm. So if you imagine that if we could shift 10% of that $160 billion spend to more local or regionally grown agricultural products, specialty crops, fruits and vegetables, the economic value that that creates, um, the jobs that come along with that, it's a more specialized form of agriculture, um, the health that that creates, it, it, it would have more of an impact than if every white tablecloth restaurant tomorrow went farm to table. You're talking $16 billion. That's a significant marketplace. Um, and, and I've seen a lot of change. When, when I look at the local food scene, you know, back in 1981, I'm, I'm a chef first, have been a chef for 35 years, and I was making 40 phone calls to have 5% of everything in my cooler come from a local producer. Today I can make maybe 15 phone calls and have 100% of almost everything in my restaurant come from a local producer. That's real progress. When we started with Wholesome Wave in 2008, I remember having conversations with dear valued colleagues of mine around this notion of looking at these large pots of federal dollars, creating programs that would demonstrate what would happen if it was spent differently, um, and that we were hoping to use that approach to get policy change. They said, Michelle, you know, you're a motivated guy, you're gonna do some great things, but please don't be heartbroken when you don't see policy change. And last year, the Food and Security Nutrition Incentive Program passed in the farm bill with $100 million to double food stamps for fruits and vegetables. Now it's pencil dust when you look at the overall value, it's almost a trillion dollar agricultural bill, but it's in there. And it's harder to take something out when it's in there than it is to grow that, to make it more permanent. And when we look at all the other community food projects work, that you can now use food stamps to buy CSA shares, which is the most affordable way to buy fruits and vegetables, including in grocery stores. I see a tremendous amount of movement. When I look at the intellectual capacity in this room, the only thing that is missing are, are the faces of color in a lot of the communities that we serve. Um, you know, they, these are folks that actually have a voice, and I've seen more enthusiasm in black, Hispanic, Somali, Cambodian, even poor white communities when affordability is unlocked. So I, I, I really believe that we're, 
we're getting close to a tipping point. So I'm incredibly hopeful about what, yeah. what's, what we're going to see. What do you think, Julie? What's in, in terms of particularly government change? We've talked here about, you know, can we push food into the national agenda and better political agenda? Um, how do you strategize getting money from the government for, uh, you know, for feeding people who are hungry? And how's that landscape changed for you? Well, the government feeding programs are critical in this country. I mean, 48 million Americans rely on them. Um, the food stamp comes out of the farm bill, which is a huge omnibus, omnibus bill that renews every five years. And, and getting the kind of programming in that Michelle's talking about is really important. Mm -hmm. um, it lets us be creative um, in a fairly small way within a huge bill, but that will grow, as you said. Getting it out will be harder. Um, child nutrition reauthorization has just been postponed a little bit, but preserving those great nutritional standards that were put in the last go around for school meals, for example, is going to be really important. And so um, City Harvest is a member of Feeding America, and they have a great um, policy division that's working constantly on these government programs. We're going to have questions in a second. I just want to ask one more thing. You know, we have... Um, you know, sort of the good food artisan, you know, farmer's market, you know, movement that happens, a lot of the people in this room. And then we have um, food advocacy and, and hunger uh, uh, community. One is um, not as wealthy generally. One is more racially diverse. As you say, this room is wealthy, whiter. Um, I, I think it's taken a while for the people who were um, fighting for good and delicious food at the high chef level to come to see that um, hunger and food insecurity was also their issue, and for the folks on this side to see that, that they have allies over here. Are, is that, are those two worlds coming together more? Oh, big time, uh, big time. So um, one of the thing, projects I've been working on recently is called uh, the Chef's Action Network, founded by Eric Kessler of Arabella Advisors in partnership with the James Beard Foundation, and we've been doing three boot camps a year, bringing 15 chefs together who are interested in advocacy. Um, as a chef, you have to apply through the James Beard website, and we only see 15 at a time. So we've had 100 chefs go through, and we have a waiting list of over 600 mm -hmm. chefs that are inter interested in advocacy. So these are business people, these are employers, these are local and regional celebrities, some are national celebrities, and all of them are saying that food is a single subject to them, has more economic power, environmental healing power, human health healing power, more societal heal healing power than any other single subject. Um, and I, I, I see it coming together. You know, the opportunity for us to actually be able to look at how chefs and food professionals and farmers represent all of the different congressional districts, not just as voters, but as business people, as employers, and as people who reach vast numbers of constituents and can influence your customer and the way that they vote. You take a tool, I, I'm gonna to keep saying it because I just think food policy action is one of the smartest things that's happened in a long time. And, and I encourage everybody to throw whatever support they can behind it. Because I, you know, I, I can take a look at two, two folks that are running for office and one is pro-choice and one is pro-life. And I can't use the fact that they're either one or the other to say, this is gonna be someone who's good for our government or bad for our government, but it's a very polarizing issue and is very effective in getting large blocks of voters to go from one direction to the other. But if you actually look at two candidates and one is voting for good food for children and voting for affordable, equitable access to good food for people struggling with poverty and the other one is against those things, I'm gonna guess that the person that's for it might be a better decision maker, might be a more genuinely concerned citizen and less vested in being bought out by some kind of corporate interest than someone who's gonna make the decision not to vote for better school food. So I think it's a powerful tool. I think food is actually, so we can talk about hunger, but at the core of hunger is food and access to food. And when we can actually help the folks that don't have that access exercise their power Mm -hmm. as caring parents, even if they're a single parent, whatever it might be, we, there's something very powerful to unlock. And I, I think it's all of our job to figure out a way to do that. Uh, Jilly, what do you think of the two worlds? I mean, do you want to add it? We're going to go to questions in a minute, but what's your... Uh... Yeah, you know, we're, we're definitely seeing the two worlds come together. And, and within the Healthy Neighborhoods Program, and look, City Harvest's mission is to end hunger. It, it's right there and why we exist. Mm -hmm. But through Healthy Neighborhoods Programming and Community Action mm -hmm. Networks, we are seeing 
people coming together around issues of food, creating food policies mm -hmm. within their community. And that should all build up into the local, the regional, and the national food policy that we need to preserve the food systems we have. Yeah, and we're working to make our organizations irrelevant. <laughs> That's right. what, right? <laughs> um, does somebody have a question? Uh, yes, please, sir. I have a question specifically for Jilly, um, especially with the, the neighborhood program mm -hmm. that you have. When you think of some place like the Bronx, which has the biggest food distribution center in the world, with Hunts Point's Market and the Fulton Fish Market, but you can't really access good food in the bodegas close to it. Is there any accountability from the distributors? Like, because I say this thing, like, you go to a Baldor, will ship a watermelon radish to 11 Madison Park, but I can't get a good apple in a bodega five minutes away from their facility. So thinking about how to work with them. It's a big problem. That. South Bronx was our first healthy neighborhood. We started that program 10 years ago. Um, I'm not aware of any, any written accountability that they have. Uh, those are really tough neighborhoods, as you, you may well know, for people to go and find um, not only somewhere to spend the food dollar, but somewhere to spend it well. And so those issues of access are really critical, and we see them keenly in the South Bronx. But would that be like a government thing where you would say, the city of New York would say, if you're going to be distributing food in a neighborhood, you've got to make sure that some of that food gets into the neighborhood somehow in the way that you have to do affordable housing if you want to buy a, build a skyscraper? It, it, it's actually, some of it's a supply chain issue. So this is something that few folks actually are aware of. Um, if you... The Cisco of the grocery industry is called super value. So if you're in the retail grocery business, that's kind of your only supply chain option. And there are some mid-sized folks, but they have to be able to compete with super value. So when you buy a pallet of bananas, if you're a super stop and shop, a case, a 40 pound case of bananas is 20 bucks. If you split the pallet, it's $28. If you split the case, it's $18 for a half case of bananas. A bodega is going to buy a half case of bananas. They're paying double what a super stop and shop pays, and their customer is less capable of buying bananas at all. Mm -hmm. So you're paying double. Yeah. So a lot of these bodega owners are seen as ripping off uh, their neighborhoods. They just they really don't have much of a choice. But I think it's an incredible opportunity for small and mid-sized producers. What's missing is that infrastructure, the supply chain infrastructure, because it's a lot easier in New York to put more affordable for a bodega to buy. Um, you know, New York grown apples at wholesale than to pay double for a case of bananas. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so there, these are, supply you know. Supply chain issues. Yeah. yeah, supply chain issues, yeah. Great question. Another question. Let's try to get a f through a few here. Everybody's against hunger. They're for, okay. Yes, back here. Thanks. In, in striving for coverage of a large community of hungry people, how do you deal with the tension between meeting the needs for quantity and meeting the needs for quality in the food you provide? We were talking about this, the big bag, of, the, the, ten, the 10 cent ramen noodle package versus mm -hmm. a healthier option, right? Yeah. It's yeah. just, fill, you mean like filling the belly versus... Yeah, yeah we, had, we, we were doing some math on our, our prep call and you know, a, after SNAP benefits run off, out mid-month, there are many families of four that have $2 to spend on dinner for a family of four. They take that $2.50 bus ride to a grocery store, they'll find broccoli at $2 a head, and they'll find an eight pack of instant noodles at $1.49. What's for dinner tonight? It's not gonna be a quarter head of broccoli, so, or a fifth of a head, actually, if the parent eats. So, so it's, it's, it's a huge challenge. It's, it's a big gap. You, you, like, do you, is the issue like any calorie at all, or are you all getting more specific about what kind of calorie? No, so that's, that's where an organization like City Harvest, to the extent we'll, we'll rescue and deliver 55 million pounds of food this year, over half of it will be fresh fruits and vegetables and be really good quality fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, and, and the other statistic we really hew tightly to is that 87% of the food that we rescue and deliver is considered nutrient dense. Mm. Um, uh, so I'm not saying we'll never take a donut, we just are very careful. We will we'll say yes every now and then, yeah. um, but we really work hard to make sure that the food we deliver is as healthful and nutritious as it can be. Even poor people like donuts, so there you go. Um, is there another question out there? Anybody have another thing they want to, point they want to bring up? Don't be shy, so, yes. So Try to end it. Thank you. 
The extent to which you try to end it by uh, getting calories to people who can't afford them rather uh, versus addressing underlying causes like poverty and how that divides uh, in the anti-hunger organizations and in the policies and politics that follow from them. Because I've seen it be divisive. I'm curious how you see it right now. Yeah. Particularly around economic justice, also racial justice. It, um, I, obviously, it's going to vary from hunger organization to hunger organization. At City Harvest, our focus is primarily on food on the plate. You know, how much food can we get and distribute to the 1.4 million New Yorkers who are struggling to put food on their plate? And so that's really um, what we're held to by our board of directors. But you'll see that change from organization to organization. Yeah. Good and, question. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. yeah, and I think, you know, ending, obviously, if you end, ended poverty, you would end hunger. Mm -hmm. So when we look at things like wage laws, wage rules, a lot of the things that are being argued about now, they're very, very important, but they're, they're heavy lifts, long lifts. Um, you know, taking a look at what, what's happening now in the restaurant industry with a few leaders, one of whom's in this very room, in the way that they're, you know, paying food service workers. These are major steps where business is actually leading um, you know, the space. But I, I, again, I, I argue when we take a look at the 1% of subsidies um, that, are, that go to fruits and vegetables, less than 1%, but 50% of that we're supposed to eat. Um, Leopold Center did a study of the six Midwestern states. What would happen if they actually produced 80% of the fruits and vegetables that were being purchased retail? It would create almost a three-time economic value over cereal and oil seed crop agriculture because you need more support services, specialized equipment, more workers, et cetera, et cetera. So food itself can become a real employment opportunity to help end the poverty. So it's, again, creating that full circle of understanding that food is more than just getting fuel to somebody or even high-quality fuel to somebody who needs it and can't afford it. It's actually how do you turn that, that advent into an employment opportunity, and I, I believe that that's something that we can focus on and get done. Well, thank you both for being here, and thank you for your work. Thanks. Okay.